Well, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you who are in Asia. I'm delighted to welcome you to this session in our series on mobility. Asia moves forward in the fourth industrial revolution. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the US Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford. We're very proud to produce this center. And we first of all want to say thank you to all of the member companies of our center, which is an industry affiliates program. We have 24 member companies and they were shown right before we got started today. So thanks very much to them. That's how we can put on these programs. And today I'm very happy and excited because we get to talk about a future of mobility that really has to do with people wanting to have a particular kind of way to get around. You know, we see a lot about electric vehicles. We see a lot about autonomous vehicles. What about the motorcycle? You know, will the motorcycle continue to exist? Why do people like motorcycles? So today we have exactly the right person to uh, talk to us about this topic. Mr. Yoshimoto Matsuda currently has two jobs in the Kawasaki Group. First, he's Deputy General Manager of Kawasaki Heavy Industries Advanced Smart Mobility Supervisory Division. The second position is he's head of Kawasaki Motors Advanced Countries Motorcycle Business and also Deputy General Manager of the R&D Division. So this means he's in charge of current and future motorcycle business, especially for developed countries. He um, is serving as a leader of product design and also advanced technology development. So Matsuda-san joined Kawasaki Heavy in 1994, and that means he has 27 years of experience in research and development. His specialty is really engines. He covers high-speed engines, electronic control, electric vehicles, hybrid electric vehicles, and hydrogen engines. He's experienced as a project leader, not only in advanced development and racing activities, but also in vehicle production technologies. He's filed more than 100 patents and is a licensed professional engineer in Japan. He loves motorcycles. And uh, just final thing, he holds his master's degree in engineering from Nagoya University in Japan, which is probably the top uh, university in Japan with regard to automobile and related technologies. So Masada-san, thank you so much for joining us from Kobe, Japan. The floor is yours. Thank you, Richardson. Okay, shall I start my presentation? I think that's great. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to start my presentation. Uh, today, I am happy to be here to make a presentation all of you. The topic is the future of motorcycles. I would like to share my idea or the concern, which I'm always thinking during my life with the r and uh, By this presentation, hopefully you have an interest to uh, create something new with the uh, motorcycle or motorcycle industry. It is my pleasure. Before the presentation, I have to say this. <clears throat> this present presentation is just based on my uh, own experience and the way of my own ex uh, thinking. It may not necessarily reflect official Kawasaki strategy. I got to cover the following contents. Uh, one, I love motorcycle. Second, pros and cons of motorcycle. Uh, three, my two thoughts on the future of motorcycle. Four, uh, motorcycle industry, three advantages that could be applied in a new mobility. Five is summary. Uh, before I go down to the contents, uh, I would like to introduce uh, briefly about my company, Kawasaki Motors and the Kawasaki Heavy Industry to you. As you may see on the screen, uh, the total net sale is $14 billion in the physical year 2020. Aerospace uh, engine system, uh, precision machinery, ship, rolling stock, and the motorcycle and the engine. 
The green portion is the Kawasaki Motors, which is 22% of the total sales, roughly. <clears throat> and our business field, uh, as you see, motorcycle, off-road, four-wheel, so-called side-by-side, and the personal watercraft, it is jet ski, and the uh, general purpose engines. Here you see the image of Kawasaki motorcycle industry, uh, motorcycle history. Kawasaki has introduced a number of the historical motorcycles, including the H1, Z1, and GPZ900R. Since it first sell of Samurai, we call Samurai bike in 1963. Uh, our goal is enabling riders to more completely control high performance machine and enjoy the pleasure of riding. Since last year, we have been experiencing the pandemic. Uh, nobody can predict how the world will change. But for the motorcycle sales was good and actually increased from 1.1 million to 1.2 million. Uh, roughly to say 10% more motorcycle we saw in the developed, developed countries overall. So I assume in COVID, uh, COVID situation, people want to move privately or avoid to move in the public way. And the people want to have a fun to ride in their close area under the travel restriction. Okay, so that's all the brief introduction of Kawasaki Motors and the Kawasaki Heavy Industry. We can go down to the contents. <clears throat> I'd like to start the reason why I love motorcycles. Yes, this is me, a very happy smile. <laughs> uh, when I asked myself- So uh, Masada-san, when was yes. that picture taken? Uh, this one? Uh, the, the, yeah. Actually, I was the project leader of this bike, Ninja ZX10R, and I was invited from the Australian people to make uh, share the, the, this bike introduction with riding, discuss. After this, we drink a beer a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so this was still a test ride? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is already finished to pro, uh, oh, okay. uh, development. We already start the uh, production, but this. Uh, Really, really beginning. So they they want okay. to yes they want to uh, write a discuss together with me. Everybody right. happy. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> then okay, when I asked myself why I love motorcycle, I found the two main reasons. The first one is the uh, the fun. I think motorcycle is not just a vehicle for the riders. I mean, the rider feels motorcycle is a part of his body or an extension ability of the human body and the ability. Uh, you can imagine its movement at a level of high speed that can be reached by the living body, a strong acceleration, quick motion, and wide range transfer. All those are impossible by the human ability itself. Uh, my key point, Motorcycle is an extension ability of human body and ability. It is one of the most different from the automobile. The second one is attractiveness. Yes, it's the feeling of the riding of motorcycle. The wind, temperature, smell, sound, and vibration, heat, and uh, we hear the road surface condition, etc. More realistic and direct experiences and it also enables uh, interacting with the people who share the experience and the feelings. So uh, the extension ability of the human body and the direct feeling of motorcycle, these two are the most different point from automobile, I think. And personally, I'm very happy to create the technology. Uh, I have been spent all my career to create new technology and improve motorcycle. It was full of excitement. So I am happy with motorcycle r and life. So 
before we talk about the future motorcycle, I'd like to share and talk about the pros and cons of motorcycle. The pros, please mind the energy efficiency. For just one person moving, automobile must carry its weight of roughly 2,000 kilograms, but the motorcycle is just 200 kilograms. And the production and the supply chain is another story, I think. Roughly to say, automobile has a 30,000 parts to be built. So we need to transfer all parts from the lowest cost prices to assemble. But it needs CO2 to bring. On the other hand, motorcycle just has a roughly 4,000 parts only. Yes, you see, quite big difference. I want to go to another pros. Less traffic jam because <laughs> of the space efficiency in the traffic and more parking because of the space efficiency in the town, especially the traffic in the Silicon Valley, I think you could understand. But the cons, safety issue. There can be a reckless driver who doesn't care about the motorcycle people or the road condition could be bad. Uh, for example, a slippy road with rain or sand on the surface or snow, something. Maybe this can be the most concern. Safety solution is needed to be provided, I think. Until here, I share the current situation of the motorcycle. And from here, I so like to... Masuda san, if, yes. if I can uh, interrupt for just a second, mm -hmm. the safety issue is not because the motorcycle is made poorly. It really has to do with the amount of things surrounding you yes, yes. from the outside. You don't mm -hmm. have as much protection from uh, in the middle of an accident, mm -hmm. say, right? Yes. Actually, one, as the one of the rider, I feel something, the difference, the recognition from the automobile people, because normally I ride uh -huh. a bike a little bit higher place my head, so I can see very yeah. wide range than the automobile people. But uh, I know myself yeah. the, how the motorcycle behavior, so I can check even in, even I uh, ride, I drive the car, I can yeah. check the backward about the motorcycle behavior, but uh, the people who doesn't ride a motorcycle, maybe they don't check that maybe between the car something, then uh -huh. without checking, change the uh, direction range. I feel something uh, uh, dangerous when I drive okay. the bike. So maybe this is a yeah. big gap, I think, between the automobile driver and the motorcycle uh, ride, I think. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, our uh, first one is the improvement for the reliability extension. Second one is carbon neutral impact to the motorcycle design. As I said before, from my point of view, motorcycle is an enhancement tool for the human ability. Up to now, we can say that we have been mainly developing the engine performance or the riding performance of the motorcycle itself which is, let's say, performance-oriented. Let's have an overview of motorcycle technology development in last decades. The first category is propulsion, power, and speed-related technologies. Roughly to say, in 1990s, engine with 1,000 cc exhaust capacity create 120 horsepower, roughly. But at the year 2000, engine create 200 horsepower with 1000 cc. And now we have a supercharger and a 230 horsepower in the public road. But in the limited cost, you can buy the motorcycle with 300 horsepower without any emission or noise restriction. The second category is uh, controlling technology. A lot of electronics were introduced to improve the motorcycle control or handling. And recently, we introduced the power electronics 
like uh, EV or hybrid EV. The third category is safety and comfort technology. This is not so much developed and must be the future development area, I think. So just now we are developing the LiDAR system, which I will explain later. So this is an overview of motorcycle technology development in these decades. And all my career is always together with those technology development. So propulsion, power and speed related, control technology and safety and comfort related. Now- So yeah. really, if, if we go back to that, Mm -hmm. The first area of performance has long been a focus of R&D. And mm -hmm. the second area about control is kind of where you see a lot of activity right now, as well as continuing work mm -hmm. on propulsion and power. Yes. So the third area is really the area for expanding uh, development, technology development from now. I think so, yes. Okay. Thank you. Now, I want to talk about the future technology target. So remaining challenge is the new technologies for the extensionability of the rider. As I talked before, the motorcycle is extension of human body and ability. From this point of view, we can say the power and speed related technology is as for the physics and the human body, I think. But the sensing, as the eye and ear, the recognition as a brain and its judge, and the uh, connecting as the mouse or ear or speaker listen, all those are still remaining challenge of the technological aspect as an extensionability of human ability. With those technology, I believe more diversified people can ride motorcycle in the future. So let me explain the procedure of the rider's action uh, from left to right box. The first step is uh, recognize. The rider must detect uh, something around him during riding. The next step is making decision. The rider must decide what they must do next. Then choose act actual action as a throttle change or the braking or steering but all those steps has the risk of mistake. And the recognized mistake has the most impact for the following uh, step, I think. And now we are developing the advanced LiDAR system. This system has a two radar in front and the rear to support to let the LiDAR recognize the surroundings. But this system just informs the rider via the dashboard or some simple light signal. So we need a So uh, uh, Masada-san, can yes. I interrupt again? Would you go back to that? Okay. Uh, if you're comfortable saying this, because I realize that there are things that become strategic, but you're looking more at radar mm -hmm. for the front and rear Mm -hmm. rather than either LIDAR or just visual camera? Now we use the uh, radar. Uh -huh. So yeah, the visual camera has a little bit the complex story we're gonna have because uh -huh. some country is district, it's uh, taking a record of the uh, load. Oh, I see. Country. Yeah, so up to the maybe legal restriction is another key. And also the maybe just check the maybe vehicle behind or uh, vehicle the distance in front. Maybe radar is a very simple system, I think. Yeah. Mm. So there's some disagreement among all the people in the automotive of the uh, autonomous vehicle world, the automobile autonomous vehicle world, about whether to go with lidar or whether to do a kind of a combination of, of radar or, or visual imaging. Actually, the, up to the, the device, the, they had a strong point and weak point. So maybe the automotive people want to make a minimum two sensors, I think. They mix uh, proper information uh, to control the vehicle, I think. So maybe in the future, 
motorcycle also has the possibility combine the two different devices to get the more precise information frontally or something. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, so uh, this is my point. So we need a smart helmet, but this is just my concept. Actually, we do not do not develop it yet, but I want to talk its possibility. Nowadays, uh, we already have the connected service, but how does the system make the communication with the rider during the riding? This is a needed technology for the motorcycle, especially. To operate the connected device, you should make a smart helmet to make a direct communication to the riders. Uh, be a human body sensor like eye and ear, or sometimes vibration. So next is my concept. Uh, LiDAR just watch a screen with a real view and the computer graphics over layered. And the voice message by the system, you can hear directly inside the helmet. This is the image of the view of the LiDAR. Uh, system judge the left car is risky and put the red color over layered and make a caution to the rider. The other additional information must uh, map directly on the object in the view. And the helmet has a camera on the backward. Uh, so monitoring the backward and put the vision behind the motorcycle and on the, you can see a right and top box is uh, behind the scene, I think. And smart helmet has more potentials. So I want to explain this potential. So I must, but before, before that, I must explain how the motorcycle make a turn. Normally, motorcycle make a turn not by the handlebar, handlebar control, but the weight shifting of the rider itself. I mean that at first, rider shift his weight into the corner and that makes the motorcycle leaning, and this leaning angle called the turning. To recognize the motorcycle behavior, the system has a gyro sensor on motorcycle and calculate the motorcycle lean angle. We use this information to calculate the cornering force and the computer inside the motorcycle, use it for the motorcycle device control, like uh, engine torque or suspension damping or braking, et cetera. Actually, we have already produced 20 to 30,000 on motorcycle with gyro sensor every year. Uh, we call this gyro sensor as an inertia measurement unit. It monitors acceleration along longitudinal and the transverse and the vertical axis the plus uh, pitch and the yaw rate we can measure. So if the smart helmet has a gyro sensor on it, the system detect the rider's weight motion before the actual motorcycle motion happen. Logically, the <coughs> current system, <coughs> excuse me, uh, must have the time delay to calculate the motorcycle motion because it calculates the motorcycle behavior after detecting actual lean angle. But if the system can detect the rider's motion fast, the system can use uh, this time, this time period for the additional calculation time. Then it gives the time for the system to predict what's happened to, happen to the motorcycle and compare the object around the motorcycle on the road. So this is the system logic. By detecting the LiDAR weight shifting, the system calculated by the motorcycle dynamic model inside the control unit on the motorcycle. And as the output, system predict the motorcycle motion. Then safety system use this information to judge and inform through the smart helmet interface. Masada san can I interrupt you again? Okay. Because that's really interesting. You know, in the automobile world, people are talking about a shift to autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. 
a shift to rider and vehicle working together more. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, that the, the vehicle would respond immediately to what the rider is doing electronically as mm-hmm. opposed to mechanically. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that it's a very interesting kind of new model for vehicle rider interaction. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think Thank so. You. Yeah, I think so. It, it seems like uh, maybe by weight shifting, it means uh, we can measure the wheel of the rider before uh-huh. the actual behavior of the motorcycle. So system can detect uh, this motorcycle we going to right or going to left. Maybe we can communicate the automobile around the motorcycle. Maybe this is another story we can create, I think. And it would be um, very responsive, very quickly, mm-hmm. and probably more safe. I think so. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry to interrupt again. Mm-hmm. Okay. So smart helmet must have the gyro sensors and the riding suits also better to have on it. We should think about the smart suits as well, but this is another possibility for the precise calculation. Then the system on the motorcycle can combine the information from the smart helmet and the smart suits. System can predict the motorcycle behavior and compare with the circumstance situation. The rider recognizes the disc properly. Uh, but right now, the motorcycle company has a business of motorcycle itself, and the helmet maker or the riding suits maker are separated and they have their own business interests, I think. So, to make this realize and to make this concept realize, we must break or rebuild the business structure or the business scheme to cooperate. Because uh, without motorcycle dynamic model, smart helmet can't work. Uh, precisely, uh, and the smart helmet doesn't mean, does not any mean, meaning it's smart performance with a motorcycle computer. And during the ride, system can detect the rider's bio information. Based on the rider's behavior and the mental workload, the stress situation, there is possibility for observing the physical condition or providing the medical treatment, I think, because helmet is directly contact your body. Okay, this is a smart helmet concept. Next concept, uh, next topic is uh, carbon neutral. This is one of the most concerned nowadays. I think that carbon neutral make uh, impact to the motorcycle design. Uh, this is an uh, electronic motorcycle study, which I was charge of its project leader before. As you can see, the space of the battery is quite huge. With the latest technology, the energy density of battery is still 100 times smaller than the gasoline. So if the people want to ride more powerfully or ride longer range, we need more battery. It means more weight, more cost, and a larger size for the battery space is needed. Uh, so I uh, think the hybrid is another choice. Half use of gasoline, half use the battery. So just for everybody, if you haven't been in this world, ICE is internal combustion engine. Yes. And BEV is battery electric vehicle. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. The blue box is an inner combustion engine, ICE engine. And the yellow circle is a traction motor. And the red box is a battery. The however system becomes more complex, but I said this is another uh, option. So I think up to the demand, people will choose the motorcycle differently. In this graph, the horizontal way is a travel range and the vertical is a power range. <clears throat> In the small travel range with low power demands, 
we will use the battery EV like e-bike. But the longest range and the high power range, people will use the ICE, which means inner combustion engine. But the fuel need to be changed from now, like a biofuel or some e-fuel, e some meat station. This is my concept. And the intermediate, there is a field for the hybrid. Some people say, how about the hydrogen engine? Uh, the challenge is the tank capacity, I think. This is a very rough estimation uh, to compare with the gasoline and the hydrogen. Even with the 70 megapascal pressurized, as you see, you, uh, with a big tank on the screen, you can see, the riding range of the motorcycle will roughly 30% of the current motorcycle with gasoline. Here we need some technological breakthrough. Now I'm, I am enjoying to study about this possibility. From the motorcycle design point of view, <clears throat> when we think the larger space for the propulsion system, three wheeler has more space logically. So I think carbon neutral propulsion system will make a design impact to the motorcycle mature race. This is a concept of the three-wheeler, which I have already demonstrated at the Tokyo Motor Show in 2014. I was involved with this concept creation. Up to now, I talk about the technological issue for the future motorcycle, like the smart helmet concept to extend humanity, especially from the safety point of view, and the carbon neutral technology will make an impact to the motorcycle design. So uh, Masada-san, maybe you've got a slide on this, but if I'm not mistaken, the angle of the front wheels can change, almost like the airline, airplane wings can uh, shift from being straight to being curved backward. Mm -hmm. The wheels can either be more parallel or even or stretched out more mm -hmm. at the bottom. Is that correct? Yes, it's up to the maybe cornering force or the cornering speed. It must be a little bit uh, modified. But uh, from the mechanical design point of view, but uh, we can make a well balance. So if we find a well balance, we don't not need to control the so much uh, complexity. Okay. Mm, I believe we can manage, I think. Okay. Thank you. And the next, and the also the last item. <clears throat> I like to uh, think about the usage of motorcycle technology and the motorcycle industry to create a new mobility. I like to address the motorcycle industry had three advantages that could be applied for the new mobility. I have three point of view. First one is durable functional parts of the motorcycle technology. Second one is a flexible manufacturing of motorcycle. The last one is motorcycle light and the small engine application. Durable functional parts of motorcycle technology. As you can see, motorcycle can be used in the hard condition, in wet or in the dirt. And afterwards, people can wash the motorcycle. So all functional parts like an electronic box or sensors and the brake, switches, meter must be requested water and the vibration proof, which is much harder request requirement than the, that of the automobile parts. So you can use the motorcycle functional parts of waterproof and vibration proof to create a new mobility. Uh, such as uh, autom autonomous baggage carrier like AGB uh, or the lightweight e-bike. Now this is just a sketch or idea. The second one is a flexible, flexible manufacturing of motorcycle. Automobile is based on the highly invested production, a quite long line with uh, many robots. But the motorcycle production line is very short and flexible. So to start a new mobility production, you can make a small start with motorcycle production line. 
the reason why motorcycle production doesn't need so much high investment is mainly caused by the chassis design concept. <clears throat> Automobile chassis is fabricated by the press technology. Press inst instrument is normally high cost and it requires the spot welding process with a lot of robots. On the other way, the motorcycle chassis is based on the pipe and bending process. This is very economical. In my opinion, in, in order to meet the uh, diversified demand or customization requirement, it's better to design the, the production line with new mobility, applying the pipe and the bending concept. The last one is the direct utilization of motorcycle light and small engine to the other application. This is our example. We use a motorcycle supercharged engine for the VTO. Maybe we can use the engine for the other application as well. And now Kawasaki start to create a new mobility incorporation, the technology of robot, motorcycle and the aviation. I am also in charge of this project as an advanced mode mobility supervisory division. And I want to close my presentation with an open question. We can combine motorcycle with something far away business such as medical healthcare, education, finance, insurance, or real estate, etc. I think we have freedom and flexibility of doing something new with motorcycle, no matter what you do. So lastly, I want to summarize my presentation today. First of all, I explain my point of view on motorcycle. And I believe that motorcycle have always enhanced the human ability. And with the new sensor technologies, this process will continue. And second, I address motorcycle industry's advantage in the durable functional parts and the flexible production line. And the ecosystem of motorcycle can provide a strong difference to create new mobility and improving the manufacturing process. And the mot uh, motorcycle uh, has always been bringing happiness and excitement to the world. And I believe is a technological improvement of the motorcycle. We can enjoy motorcycle more and more in the future. Motorcycle will always be fun. That's all for my presentation today. Thank you very much for listening. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, thank you very much. That's, That's great, Masada-san. Thank you very much for this presentation. I think your last point is something that all of us need to remember in regard to the future of mobility. Mm -hmm. There will always be room for something being fun. Um, maybe you can go ahead and stop sharing your slides and we'll go back to gallery view. Okay. And if anyone has questions, let me suggest that you write them in chat. We've got more people than I can fit into one window. So I may not see your question, or I may not see your hand if you're raising it. So please uh, write your questions in chat and then I'll relay them to uh, Mr. Matsuda. Um, as we get started, it was fascinating that the world sales of motorcycles actually went up during COVID-19. A lot of people are thinking that because of aging societies in Japan and in China and in other countries, that that's going to really drive autonomous vehicles. Do you think that will be a major negative for the future of motorcycles? I think it depends on how to communicate in the actual public road in the autonomous car and the motorcycle together. Maybe one side, how to keep the safety issue. Uh, uh -huh. Because if we can make a 
maybe digital information transfer between the motorcycle and the car, maybe autonomous scan system predicts uh, uh, motorcycle behavior around, around, around this car. This is one solution. Uh -huh. On the, this is one topic. The other topic is more and more people, uh, more and more automobile car go to the autonomous, maybe people will start to do something inside the car, maybe the movement in the public road is uh, just a movement, I think. But, uh, yeah. in but in contrast, I think that riding a motorcycle itself is kind of the joy and fun. So meaning of the motorcycle getting more stronger and stronger, I think. So maybe uh, more the automobile go to the automars, I think the more uh, attractiveness or popular getting stronger for the motorcycle business. So I think- I think that's a really important point for everybody to keep remembering because uh, you know people's mentality, people's thinking is going to really drive markets in the future. Uh, and if people want the joy of riding, they will find the joy of riding. I was really interested in the kind of idea of having a smart motorcycle sort of working with a smart helmet and a smart suit. Um, I'm guessing, like you said, that the people who make the smart helmet and the people who make the smart suit will probably be other companies. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually a company in Japan that's making a clothing type that has integrated circuits embedded in the clothing, Zenoma, X-E-N-O-M-A. So I know that these companies are out there. What kind of interface would you need in order for the motorcycle to be able to communicate with that kind of smart clothing and so forth? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe technical side, maybe we have a little bit complex, we must talk something, but maybe communication between the suit and the motorcycle, we use uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Then the, uh -huh. mm, uh -huh. this is a, uh, maybe, I think this is a more simple way, but on the other hand, maybe we need to something get gateway inside the motorcycle because uh, we must avoid some hacking from the outside the system. Yeah. Mm, this is maybe motorcycle side needs some, some, something for the device side and the maker uh, just communication with like a protocol. But uh, logically, uh, the technical uh, aspect is not so difficult, I think. Okay. Mm. Um, but what would a startup company have to do in order to be able to propose a partnership to a major, you know, pardon me for calling you a motorcycle OEM, right? A motorcycle manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And also the helmet or the suit, it's much more the, you know, the rider's personal device. So because sometimes people change the motorcycle. They have two or three, or sometimes they sell or buy something but they keep yeah. the smart helmet as his own. So maybe much more, not only for the functionality, but also the much more design or the much more brand meaning. Maybe I think smart helmet has more meaning, I think, for the marketing uh -huh. side, I think. So one of our uh, friends in the audience, Jerry Fuqua, mentions a uh, smart helmet idea that was developed by a company called Scully Technologies around 2013. And he says, I think the company is now defunct. Have you heard of them or were they just too far ahead of their time? No, I, I didn't know where we about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of anyone who is making a smart helmet now? For well, this moment, I, I don't recognize. Maybe some people okay. say personally, uh, because I'm a, a lot of communication with uh, around the people, but uh, it's kind of the talking during the drinking beer or something. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in your presentation, kind of moving on to the next topic, mm. 
uh, it talked a lot about the safety of motorcycle and that that driving kind of motor, uh, you know, rider safety and comfort would be a major area for development from the future. Mm -hmm. um, with the limitations of EVs and um, hybrid electric vehicles, do you think that there will be public pressure against, you know, or regulatory pressure against motorcycles because they probably will continue to use internal combustion engines for some time. I know that most automobiles, I think, are supposed to become EVs by 2030 mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe, OK, this is not uh, reflect my company strategy. This is just a part of my sure. personal point of view. Sure, we need to maybe take action for the demand for the market this is uh, our first priority. People want to prefer to use the EV. Maybe we must make an answer to them. But uh, just think about the maybe energy uh, balance in the future, something. Maybe just use every 100% EV is not uh, maybe meet the actual condition the maybe uh, resources in the arts or something. So maybe in the future, logically, we need a mix of the uh, IC and the EV battery uh, propellant system. This is a actual future, I think. Well, and I also think that this has to do with the place of motorcycles as opposed to other maybe two-wheeled uh, vehicles like scooters. Mm -hmm. I wonder uh, if you think that um, there's going to be a greater diversity so that the motorcycles will be there for the people who really love performance, but maybe around the city where there's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. to get rid of carbon completely, mm -hmm. you'll have more short range, um, mm -hmm. you know, carbon neutral things like mm -hmm. um, battery powered um, scooters. Mm. So I think the one solution is a hybrid, I mean, so with the hybrid system, maybe we can stop the engine inside the city or town. Maybe we can move just with the EV mode, electric vehicle mode, then go out from the city, they start again engine with the double usage of the electric propulsion and the IC propulsion both. Maybe one solution I see. Because the people okay. normally who use a motorcycle for their uh, daily use, maybe they go to the office inside uh, like a party something, they bus travel 30 or 40 kilometers from their own house. Maybe moving just only by EV is not logical. But uh, if they, it's restricted to accept by the IC in the politically, maybe uh, normal gasoline engine cannot reach the parties inside, for example. So then we must change the proper yeah. system up to the area or something. The hybrid system can solve this problem, I think. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting in talking with you before, you know, as we were preparing for the session over these last few weeks and months, mm -hmm. um, the kind of attitudes, expectations about motorcycles that are different in the major markets. How is Kawasaki regarded among the motorcycle markets in say North America versus in Europe versus in other markets? Are you considered to be more kind of high-end uh, performance bicycles or uh, motorbikes or What's the, what's the, how do you, how do you see those different markets right now? Mm, sorry, Richardson. Today is, I am come here as my personal people. Okay. So maybe it's not better to talk about our business. Strategy. Got it. Yeah, sorry. No, that's quite all right. That's fine. Uh, understood. Uh, we'll move on. Maybe I can uh, talk Mr. to the past, past has, <laughs> Yeah, sure. Mr. Oishi says, thank you for your impressive presentation. I'd like to know more detail about um, 
your new business, if you don't mind, about collaboration with education, for example. Uh, so in regard to um, connecting with, say, driver training, is Kawasaki actively involved in the teaching yeah, of sure. no, how okay. to ride motorcycles? Mm. I think the during my presentation, why I put the keyword like education is not limited as a riding school, I think. Because a riding school is uh, actually operated already with the Kawasaki Motors uh, sales company uh, one by one. But my, uh -huh. my point of view, some scientists about the brain uh, logic something, the riding motorcycle uh, puts a, in, a strong input for the human to use a different portion of the brain because uh, uh -huh. a lot uh, sensing, a lot of uh, 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 instinct to the people and the people must decide, people must think a lot much more than the driving the car. So maybe riding motorcycle itself has a good, uh, well impact for the human brain, human body. Maybe this is one possibility I'm just imagine. And for the, okay. for the also for the kids, maybe younger age, maybe riding small motorcycle make a good uh, education. I think like uh, playing baseball or something, because uh, the rider, a uh, uh, kid as a rider all responsibility he has or she has uh, to open throttle or cross throttle. So everything they must decide. Sometimes they must prepare the mechanical part. By this way, I can put it uh, education the normal uh, people in the school or education system, I think. This is my meaning. Okay, thank you. So Gordon Endo asks, first of all, he starts out pointing out that you're slide earlier in your presentation about the uh, rider pivoting the front wheel of the motorcycle reminds him of an image of a centaur, right? The ancient Greek half human, half horse uh, creature. He says, uh, my question is, what do you think of using gyros, not just to act as sensors, but as a more powerful means to keep the motorcycle upright when it's stopped so when the wheels stop turning, uh, would the gyro keep it upright so you don't have to balance it? Mm -hmm. And uh, also possibly even uh, when it uh, is hit by another vehicle, um, have there, you know, he says there have been many attempts and mm -hmm. he mentions the BMW C1 a mm -hmm. couple of years ago, mm -hmm. but he hasn't really seen anything in production of mm -hmm. really actively using gyros. Mm -hmm. I think what it, kind of possibilities for gyros mm -hmm. are there? Mm -hmm. I think uh, this solution was approached in many ways, I think. But uh, technically, it's possible. Because, uh, for example, this is also my patent. Uh, if you put the two motors in front of the rear, and also that you have the steering motor, then the, you make a, some the force balance in the front and the rear on the changing their steering. Maybe motorcycle can keep standing. Logically, it's possible. Uh -huh. uh, but for the people, for, as a customer, if we spend a lot of cost for the just standing to motor or de uh, device something, it is logically or not, it's a big question mark. So maybe in the laboratory, we can make it, but for the public, uh, really people or some rider customer want to keep or pay the more money for it. It's a big question mark for me. Yeah, that's a, those are very legitimate concerns. Would people really want to pay for that kind of enhancement? Mm -hmm. um, also, you have to look at the power required to keep the motorcycle upright while it's at rest. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, this kind of thing um, would be a power drain on whatever power source you've got. Maybe I found some study that they have, they keep the kinematic balancing wheel inside their motorcycle. 
the strong is uh -huh. uh, keep the standing. This is one solution. But um, my way of thinking is that we put the motor or something, some device in front of the rear and the uh, uh, steering. So I, I, I'm thinking about the battery resourcing to keep it. Okay. So besides the um, kind of, uh, um, you know, topics that we've talked about today, uh, I wonder if you, we could get your comments about the position of motorcycles in not just performance, not just rider enhancement, but for instance, in dense urban settings or after a disaster, motorcycles can go places that four wheel vehicles can't. So mm -hmm. what do you think about uh, things like uh, motorcycle ambulances or motorcycles? cycle delivery systems in uh, various places. Do you see that as expanding? Yeah, I think so. So maybe, as you say, the motorcycle can approach where can approach where the automobile cannot. And also the maybe the space efficiency or the in the public and town. So maybe you say the motorcycle is uh, very attractive, not only for the uh, right, I saw. And uh, but I think the why I say about the safety issue today, uh, I think the motorcycle itself kind of it has a contradiction inside uh -huh. because uh, it's a uh, very attractive and a very good tool for to use. But on the other hand, it has a little bit risk of the uh, drop fall down something. Yeah. Then that is why we need a technology to solve this. And of course, with the idea. So maybe we can make, just use the benefit of the motorcycle. This is the right direction, I think. Okay. Um, so Kawasaki is focusing mostly on the motorcycles um, and you're looking at advanced markets. Um, is is Kawasaki actively developing things like scooters or uh, mm -hmm. other sorts of vehicles? Richard, -san, I'm afraid to say. Can't tell. Okay, okay. <laughs> tell never mind. Okay, <laughs> got it. Yeah. Now that's quite all right. Um, so, if we do, we have more uh, questions from the audience or comments from the audience. Be happy to pick these up out of chat. If not, um, Masada-san, this has been really informative. You never hear people talking about the future of motorcycles. And I think that probably the biggest factor that is really important to emphasize today is that if people want them, they will continue to be made. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we should not lose when we talk about the future of mobility. Uh, certainly, we have to all con be concerned about the planet and about, um, you know, moving toward more carbon neutral solutions. Mm -hmm. But it may also be that there will be some sort of a trade and exchange instead of if, if you're using an ICE engine, there may be some way that you can pay a carbon credit. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's really we cannot overlook the will of the people who will actually ride and use these different kinds of, of machines. Um, do have another question real quick. Uh, Jerry asks, is regenerative braking a practical application for a hybrid or electric vehicle motorcycle? Mm -hmm. um I know this kind of question sometimes I will ask to, uh, actually <clears throat> the problem is, uh, okay, technically it can be done because uh -huh. uh, the, today I show you the electric vehicle, the pre previously I'm charge of this project leader. I designed this one. I use a regenerating system for the braking, but uh, from uh -huh. the, the rear wheel, because yeah. the motor has connected the rear wheel. But the motorcycle case for the braking, 
let's say 70% of the braking force must be in the front wheel because uh, too much braking from the rear side is not unstable during the braking. So if we want to make a more regenerating system, logically we must put the motor or generator uh, in the front wheel. So if we have the front wheel generator, I think more uh, high density uh, energy uh, recycling system we can make. So logically it's possible but it depends on the cost, I think. Okay. Um, thank you. There was also a comment about uh, Nosliso, Nosliso, mm. which is an electrically assisted three-wheel vehicle, yeah. a tricycle. Uh -huh. So that's already existing, correct? Yes. That's a Kawasaki product. Yes. Actually, the, the Project leader of North Reese is uh, working together with me. The actual same uh, division we belong, and uh, we discuss a lot before we make the North Reese. Uh, this is sure one kind of the solution, but uh, I mean this is a very short range travel and small power range like an e-bike uh, area to be used. And I also think that in regard to calculating the carbon footprint of a vehicle, you have to look at things like the how many fewer parts a motorcycle has, mm -hmm. the more efficient, uh, mm -hmm. flexible manufacturing approach that, mm -hmm. that is used in making motorcycles. It could be that a motorcycle with an internal combustion engine has a lower overall carbon footprint than mm -hmm. an electric powered automobile. I don't know. Uh, that would be an interesting thing to really calculate. I think up to now, we mark too much calculate based on the cost. To make uh -huh. it a cost lower, we put a lot of investment to make uh, more high efficiency to produce the parts and thing. But uh, if you calculate or measure by the money, yeah, maybe our whole industry was uh, the maybe system we have right now. But if we measure by the CO2, maybe the balance must be a little bit shifted, I think. But now we don't have uh -huh. a precise measurement way. Or maybe if we have all cash is based on the CO2, not data, but CO2 something, <laughs> maybe we can see yeah. easily. But maybe logically smaller parts and uh, uh, smaller weight, uh, maybe the CO2 uh, impact must be small, I think. Okay. So I want to thank you very much. What we're going to do is we'll move into a more informal session off the record um, as soon as in just a second. Uh, I want to thank you so much for a really interesting presentation about something that's not talked about very much the future of motorcycles. And for everyone here, I'd like to point out that we have a bye week next week. We don't have a, a session next week. On November 11, we will have a panel discussion between Mr. Gopal Vital, who is the CEO of the Indian communications company Airtel, and also uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant, who is the CEO of Niti Goya, Niti Ayog, which is uh, one of India's premier think tanks about mobility and digital transformation in India. So we hope you'll join us again on November 11.